Proudly we hail. Another proudly we hail, one of radio's outstanding dramatic half hours, starring Lee Tracy and presented transcribed by your Army and your Air Force. From Radio City, New York, here is your star and host on Proudly We Hail, the distinguished Broadway stage, screen, and radio star, Lee Tracy. Thank you, Kenneth Banghart, and hello, everyone. Welcome to Proudly We Hail. I feel you're going to really enjoy our program, for this is one of the most moving scripts I've had the pleasure of reading and doing in many a year. It's a story about the Air Force, about one member of the Air Force in particular, and I think you're going to feel as close to Nick as I do. We'll begin our story in just a moment after these very important words from Ken Banghart. Before you start your story, Lee, I have a short, short message to the young men of America. There may be a career for you in the United States Army or the United States Air Force and a real opportunity to serve your country. See your local recruiter right away. You're needed now. Lee, I know our audience is anxious for our play to begin. I'm sure they are, Ken, and so am I. With our star, Lee Tracy, in the role of Nick, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production of The Long Flight. Sometimes in the darkness of the night, I go back. In one sense, you could call it a dream, for it only happens when I'm asleep, but in all other ways, it's no dream. Like a swimmer caught in a fast-flowing tide, I'm swept over the barriers of time. It's as though a great wave picked me up here in the present and deposited me in a world I knew and lived in seven years ago. Every time it's the same, for the current that sweeps me into its flow is one of voices. Voices lost in time and space. There's sound a counterpart to the vibrant bass of engines in flight. Red leader. Red leader. What are you flying, Jocko and Oxcart? Close up your tails, Dragon. Coming, Mother. Navigator to pilot. How do you expect me to figure out where we are the way you're rocking this thing? That's water down there. That help, Eddie? Shut up, you guys. The tail gunner needs a sleep. Red leader. Red leader. Close up. Close up. What am I leading them? Why, Deputy Close, I'll be in your lap. Mike coming up. All right, you guys. On your toes. Red leader. Red leader. Red leader. Red leader, the only voice that is disjointed and out of place. The only voice that's not part of the rest. Perhaps it's there because I was the leader of Red Flight. Perhaps it's Scotty's voice calling to me. I don't know. Haunts me more than the others. Always begins that way, and it always takes me down. Down, out of the sky. Away from the chorus of other voices to that fateful dawn. Captain Collier. Uh, Captain Collier, time to hit it, sir. Yeah. Oh, turn off that blasted light. Sorry, sir. Will you sign this? Oh, no. Why can't this? Why can't they let a man sleep here? Here, give me the thing. Shall I wake up Lieutenant Scott? Sir? I'll wake him up. Just go away. Turn out the light. Well, you ought to be a briefing at 0330, sir, and it's 0300 now. Corporal, will you go away? Yes, sir. Oh, brother. Oh, um, hey. Hmm. Got it. Yeah? You awake? I don't know. Mm. What's the matter? Couldn't you sleep? I don't think so. Well, cheer up. It's morning. At least it will be someday. You better get up. We got a date. Date with an angel. 
I'll live it all over. I feel it. I see it. Does it happen then? As we finish dressing, go out into the warm, moist darkness, I hear the first bark of an engine as it clears its husky throat down on the line. Joined by others. By the time we enter the mess hall, the night is alive with a background of sound, a sound that is compelling, that draws at the heart, whose meaning knots the stomach. Gentlemen, this is your primary target. We know that it's well covered by plenty of back acts. Ground one will be made from 5,000 feet. The briefing room crowded and smoke-filled. The briefing officer with his pointer, his shadow enlarged on the map, exaggerating his movements. Clipped words, lecture room, manner, unemotional presentation, painting a picture that etches itself into our minds with grim finality. I keep rubbing the sweat off the palms of my hands and wishing he'd hurry up and get it over with. I already know this is... The worst yet. Nick? Huh? It's not good, is it? Never is. Yeah, this tops it, though. Doesn't seem to make much sense. Nick, I've got a feeling this time. Who hasn't? No, this is different. It's not just being scared. Knock it off, kid. Wait a minute, Nick. I'm serious. I'm serious, too. I've never felt like this before, and I know what it means. And I know there's nothing I or you or anyone can do. I just wanted to say it. It's been good knowing you. Scotty, you always had too much imagination for your own good. Don't you think I feel the same way every time we go out? You think just because you feel it all of a sudden, it's something new and different? Now stop talking like a dope. It's going to be a nice day. Hot. You couldn't pick a nicer one. All right, get it out of your system. You think this is it, huh? Yeah, Nick, I do. I woke up around midnight, and I knew then. I lay there trying to talk myself out of it, trying to get back to sleep, but I couldn't. The longer I lay there and thought, the more I knew that this was going to be the day. I... Scotty, don't you think that I wake up in the night and have the same kind of thoughts? Don't you think we all do? Maybe, but I... I... Yeah, I know. You're different. You're psychic. You're all so beat to the teeth, your nerves are all shot. You need three months of peace and quiet. You're sick to death of the whole business. I know because I'm just the same. And Pat knows because he's just the same. And Jack and Steve and Carl, all the rest of them. Another thing. You got to get more than yourself to think about. You You got a crew depending on you. Think about that. Maybe you'll snap out of it. Now, don't get sore. I'm not sore, Nick. All right, then get sore. Look, I'll show you how much I think of your half-baked premonitions. Here, take this with you. It's just loaded with good luck, full of magic. God's made it out of quicksilver. Don't be a dope, Nick. I couldn't take your good luck piece. I stand there in the growing light of that summer dawn, hot and angry, more than that, worried. There's a look in Scotty's eyes that was never there before. Resigned is the word. And the more I try to snap him out of it, the more I try to arouse him, the more aroused I get. The good luck piece was something that had been with me for a long time. The silver figure of a, of a nymph with her arms raised skyward, about two inches high. And Scotty knew I'd never flown without her. The resigned look was joined by one of stubbornness. He wouldn't take it. When he swung away from me, I lost my temper, grabbed him by the shoulder, spun him around, pulled open his shirt, thrust the figurine inside. There, now, take it. Take it or throw it away. I don't give a hoot which. When the mission is over, bring it back to me because maybe I'll need it. Stood there staring at one another, and it cut through my anger and put a chill in my heart the way he looks at me. He isn't mad like I am, and he should be. He should be mad. Mad enough to punch my teeth in instead of that. Okay, Nick. If it'll make you feel better, I'll keep it. When you need it, I'll give it back. Thanks. Oh, for the love of... 
Listen, there's only one reason I want you to take it, and that's to prove that all this superstition business is a lot of bunk. I'm the one who shouldn't come back. Only I'm coming back, see? I'm coming back every time, and you're coming back, too. Now, will you please snap out of it? We're all nuts, aren't we? I wouldn't doubt that. Only a good reason. Plenty. Gotta go pick up my boys. Yeah. Well, I'll... I'll see you later. Keep your eyes open. Good luck. Good luck, Nick. I'll take care of this thing. Sure you won't take it back? When I need it, I'll ask for it. So long. It's my dream. I watch him disappear in a half light. Thin little guy. Shoulders hunched forward as though he were cold. <laughs> Scotty the poet. Scotty, the man who knew. Brakes on. Control three and movable. Trim tap set. Flaps up. Tailwheel lock. Mixture set. Bottles closed. The litany of flights. That's what Scotty called it. That's what it is, I guess. The litany to be followed by the song. A song that leads us straight into... I didn't see him go down. I was too busy. Someone who did said his ship took a direct hit and just disappeared as though it would never been there. I dreamed to suddenly find myself walking up the cinder path to our billet. A feeling of numbness and dull shock hedged my thoughts and actions. Nothing's very clear. Even the realization of Scotty's gone has not yet penetrated deeply. Go into the room. Time has stood still here. Nothing's changed the state of disarray. That short time between our leaving and now, huh, I walk to the desk. Stand there looking down at its scarred surface. Something guides my hand to a piece of paper. There's writing on it. Scotty's writing. I read it. If I must fly in disputed air and match my wings in mortal combat, if I must die amidst the cloudland with the harsh chant of engines, soiling the silence of the universe, then, O oh God of battle, one wish I ask, one prayer I pray, let me return, ghost as I am, to guide others safely on their way. It's then that the realization that Scotty, Scotty, the poet, is dead. It's then that I awake. Our star Lee Tracy will be back with the second act of The Long Flight in just a moment. But first, I have an important message to the high school graduates in our audience. I hope you know by this time that the United States Air Force can help you plan and build a successful career. And at the same time, you can serve your country now when you're needed most. Never before in our history has there been such an opportunity for men qualified to work in radio, radar, electronics, weather, communications, and many other fields. So visit your local recruiting station and get all the details. You're needed now. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now for the second act, here again is Lee Tracy, starring as Nick in The Long Flight. That's my dream, seven years old, following me wherever I go, and since that time, I've been many places, all over the States, South America, Italy, Greece, Turkey, now here, Cairo, Egypt. These days, I'm working for a one-lung airline with flights north, east, south, and west, anywhere. There are four of us. We got two surplus C-47s, 
Tonight, I'm taking one of them to Havania. That's about 900 miles east of here across the Syrian desert. No passengers, just freight. No co-pilot, just the stars. And because of the heat, I'll take off about midnight, get there at dawn. Nice night for flying, Nick. Yeah, Doc, you want to come along? I'll be taking off for Asmara a couple hours after you, as soon as you get those goats loaded. Ah, Doc's flying ark. You can say that again. Here's your manifest, sonny. Thanks, Pete. Everything checked? Uh, one way or another. What am I hauling? Uh, mostly heavy stuff, Nick. Not too heavy, I hope. No, we left you enough room to crawl into the cockpit. That's what I like about you. You're thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my mother used to tell me. I uh, Have a nice trip. Thanks. See you when I get back. Right. I walk out into the close, hot darkness and slowly across the tarmac towards the darker silhouette of the waiting plane. In the night, it looks like a monstrous, crouching bird, huge, waiting. Off to my right, the sharp, ghostly finger of light from the control tower probes its circular way. The hangars, leftovers from the other day, stand behind me. Breeze fans against my face. There's a feel of flight in it. And overhead, the stars are bright and beckoning. How does she look? Oh, I guess she'll do, Doc. Got her wings on. Do you like to do the honors with the fire bottle? Sure. I climb into the gaping side of the ship, pull the cargo door to after me. Finally, I call down to Doc, who stands below with the fire bottle. Clear. Clear. Clear right. Clear. No longer silent, her voice barks his call through the night. She's come alive. I call the tower, get my taxi instructions. Taxi on strip three, take off on runway four, wind is southwest for seven miles, you're cleared for takeoff. Cleared for takeoff, that's the phrase I like. Slowly, gently, I ease the throttles forward. Engines leave off their chuckling, they break into song, flight song. Straight down the runway, she roars, full-throated and sure. The throttles rest against the stop. She's eager to fly. Another moment, the green lights come closer. She's ready to fly. Then the lights are gone. The earth is gone. The luminous dials of the instruments point the way through the dark void. Landing gear tucks itself in for the night, and we're on our way. At 10,000 feet betwixt heaven and earth, I fly where space and time blend together to make a world like no other. I am its only inhabitant, a voyager in limbo. Within the cockpit, the greenish light of the instrument panel is my heart. Without, the dome of the star-flecked sky is a vastness both friendly and distant. The hours tick by, the beat of the engines lulls the senses, and a man's thoughts travel strange paths. A line from one of Scotty's poems catches in my mind, and I repeat it. Over and over and over. In starlight and black darkness, in starlight and black darkness, in starlight and black darkness. I shake it loose, and my mind is full of the memory of the man who wrote it, Scotty the poet. Scotty, whose last poem was a plea to come back and help other pilots get home safely. Maybe that's what Scotty's been doing. Maybe he's, he's here with me now, here in the empty silence of the cockpit, a man's thoughts do travel strange paths, even old stranger conversation. <laughs> Hi, Scotty. Hi, Nick. It's been a long time, old buddy. It sure has. It's awful good to see you. I'm sorry about that last day, Scotty. I, I just thought... You couldn't tell, Nick. Only I could do that. I just knew that's all. You haven't changed much. No, I'm the same. Have <laughs> you written any more poetry? You're the poet now, Nick. Me? Oh. I'm just an airplane driver. How do you like this old boat bucket? Flies, doesn't she? Like crazy. Gee, it's good to see you again, Scotty. Kind of like old times, isn't it? Yeah. You remember that guy who was always... <laughs> crazy, huh? Oh, not really. When you're alone, flying through the middle of nowhere, you play a lot of strange games. I go back over all the good times Scotty and I had together, places we went, things that happened. I tell him what's happened to me since. The one thing I stay away from is the memory of that last morning. 
So after I got back, I, I went up on the Cape. I just lay there and I took it slow and easy for about two months. Must have been quite a time, Nick. <laughs> it was all of that, Scotty. Think you'll ever settle down, Nick? Not for long. This is where I live, Scotty. This is my home. All the settling down I ever do is be right here. Almost got married once. <laughs> Scared me to think about it. She, she wanted me to give up flying and take a job in her father's bank. Wouldn't I make a good banker? You're just the type. Yeah, I, I sure am. Her, her name was Leona. She, uh... Suddenly the game is over. Scotty's blotted from my mind as the stars have been blotted from the sky. One moment they were there, now the darkness above matches that below, and the plane gives an uneasy shrug, as though she too were surprised. Then, without further warning, I'm caught in the folds of something ugly and relentless. The night is no longer friendly. It's become a vicious enemy. It seeks to destroy. The plane bucks and twists dropping and rising sickeningly. I focus my eyes on the instrument panel. The dials have begun to dance weirdly to the tune of the storm. I curse myself for not having fastened my safety belt. This was to have been a clear, calm flight. Too late for that now. I decide to turn back, get out of this thing. As I start to turn, full strength of the storm hits. My head is slammed against the roof of the cockpit. How long it goes on, I don't know. I know I'm losing the fight. The earth is much closer now. And then it happens. The plane rises up and up. Engine barking in agony. And then down we plummet. Everything pulled out from underneath. And in that last instant, my head crashed again. The cot pit roof. I know this is the end. <laughs> Way off somewhere in another world, a world far from this endless sea of fog in which I've been drifting forever, I hear a sound. The sound I know, and yet it's difficult to identify. It comes closer. The fog starts slipping away slowly at first, and faster and faster. And suddenly it's all gone. I'm sitting in the cockpit of the plane with the dawn light growing strong about me. What am I doing? What's this all about? My head aches numbly and there's a taste of sulfur in my mouth. My thoughts group for an answer. Bit by bit, it all comes back, but when it's all in place, the question, what am I doing here, is changed to, by what freak of luck am I still alive? My mind is too numb to work over it. I'm alive, that's all I know, and right now it's enough. I look about me in the strengthening light. The plane is battered but still flyable. Perhaps just as strange as the fact that I realize Habania is only a few short minutes ahead. None of it adds up. The sky is pale and clear in the early morning light as I come in for my landing with the left engine, feathered, silent. Not the best landing in the world, but I get it down in one piece. Right now, that's all that seems to matter. Taxi over to the tarmac, following the directions of a man who arm waves directions. Then I cut the switch and sit limply in the cockpit for a moment, trying to rub some of the ache out of my head. After a while, I get up slowly and walk down the ramp between the heavy cargo boxes whose ropes, by some miracle, held them in place. Takes two tries to get that cargo door open. Hi there. Oh, hi, Jack. We didn't figure you were going to get here. Yeah, neither did I. You didn't fly right through that thing, did you? I don't know, Jack. What was it, anyway? One of those freak line squalls, worst I've ever seen. Came up without any warning at all. Breaks the devil around here. We tried calling you, but it didn't do much good. No. You look kind of beat up. I am. Oh, you want to you wanna check and see what kind of shape this buggy's in? She's going to beat up, too. Sure. Came in on one engine, didn't you? Yeah. The left one's all shot. Okay, I'll have a look. Thanks. I walk carefully like a man on a tightrope across the tarmac towards the low roof operation shack. My head won't seem to come out of the spin it's in. Suddenly, I hear someone calling my Mr. name. Mr. Collier, hey there, Mr. Collier. 
I stop and turn around slowly, and it's Jack. He comes running up. Hey, Mr. Collier, I found this in the cockpit. You must have dropped it. What's the matter? I stand there, looking at what Jack holds in his hand. It's the silver figure of a nymph with her arms raised skyward, about two inches high. It's the good luck charm I never flew without until I gave it to a fellow named Scotty the Poet one morning seven years ago. In the days I reach out to take it, it seems to burn my hand, and through my mind runs a poem. Scotty's last poem. If I must fly in disputed air, and match my wings in mortal combat. If I must die amidst the cloud land with the harsh chant of engines soiling the silence of the universe, then, O oh God of battle, one wish I ask, one prayer I pray. Let me return, ghost as I am, to guide others safely on their way. Thank you, Lee Tracy, for a thrilling portrayal of Nick in the long flight. I'm sure our audience agrees with me that we'll remember this gallant pilot's story for a long time to come. Well, Ken, Nick's story, while being one that touches us, is really only one of the thousands of stories being written every day by pilots such as he. Am I right? You're exactly right, Lee. I have another message, and while it may not apply directly to those pilots, it's nevertheless of real concern to American soldiers and airmen everywhere. Your Army and your Air Force, with their growing demands, need medical professionals. The Army and the Air Force Medical Services must expand. Right now, the primary need is for physicians, dentists, nurses, physical and occupational therapists, dietitians, veterinarians, and specialists trained in all medical fields. So if you're qualified, volunteer for an immediate assignment to active duty. Write or wire the Surgeon General, Department of the Army, or the Surgeon General, U.S. Air Force, Washington, D.C. And when you do it, you'll know full well that you are needed now. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented in cooperation with this station by your Army and your Air Force. Proudly We Hail stars Lee Tracy, and supporting Mr. Tracy in the cast are Joe DeSantis, Bill Lipton, Jack Jason and George Clark. The Long Flight was written by DeWitt Cox. The music is composed and conducted by John Guarneri. Proudly We Hail is directed by Charles Wilkes. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking, and here is your host and star, Lee Tracy. We hope you'll be with us next week for Proudly We Hail. We have a program I'm sure you will enjoy. It's entitled, A Party for Krovac, and it's a tale filled with suspense. Goodbye. <laughs>